Welcome to our devotional. As we explore the book of Acts, we are so glad that you have joined us. Before we begin, though, let's listen to Jonathan play some of his beautiful music. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, take the word that has been given to us, infuse it with your spirit, and make it live in our hearts. We pray in the name of our Lord. Amen. Our scripture reading for today is from the 11th chapter of Acts. In fact, it is the entire chapter. I'm going to read most of it to you. Now the apostles and the believers who were, who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also accepted the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him, saying, Why do you go to uncircumcised men and eat with them? And then Peter began to explain to them step by step, I was in the city of Joppa praying. And in a trance, I saw a vision. There was something like a large sheet coming down from heaven, being lowered by its four corners, and it came close to me. As I looked at it closely, I saw four-footed animals, beasts of prey, reptiles, and birds of the air. I also heard a voice saying to me, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But I replied, by no means, Lord, for nothing profane or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But a second time the voice answered from heaven, What God has made clean you must not call profane. This happened three times, and then everything was pulled up again to heaven. At that very moment, three men sent to me from Caesarea arrived at the house, where we were. The Spirit told me to go with them and not to make a distinction between them and us. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen the angel standing in his house, saying, Send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will give you a message by which you and your entire household will be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as it had upon us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave them the same gift that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could hinder God? And when they heard this, they were silenced. And they praised God, saying, Then God has given even to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. 
Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that took place over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch. And among them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists, proclaiming the Lord Jesus. The hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number became believers and turned to the Lord. News of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he came and saw the grace of God, he rejoiced, for he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were brought to the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There's a book in my library. Uh, I think it's on creative thinking, but it's called uh, A Whack on the Side of the Head. We all get into ruts and sometimes need a whack on the side of the head to jar us into new and different and better ways of thinking. If we bring some wrong-headed thinking into our Christian life, and if we want to grow into being more like Jesus, then sometimes the Holy Spirit has to gently, well, maybe not so gently, whack us on the side of the head to try to change our thinking. That certainly happened when God asked Peter to go to the house of the Gentile centurion Cornelius. No Jew would ever think of going into a Gentile home, much less eating with them, for fear of becoming ceremonially defiled. You remember Jesus had told the apostles to go into the world to preach the gospel to every creature. But in their centuries old way of thinking, that meant to the Jews, go to other Jews who were scattered all over the world. And the thought of preaching to pagan Gentiles and have them in addition experience the same work of grace that God gave them was unthinkable. But now the unthinkable had happened for Peter. Fortunately, he had taken some Jewish believers with him to Cornelius' house and also uh, had uh, seen what they had witnessed. Everyone in that house had seen the Holy Spirit fall upon the Gentiles in just the same way as the believing the Jews had done on the day of Pentecost. Now Luke does not want us to miss the point here because he repeats this incident in both chapter 10 and chapter 11. The point he's trying to make is that God changed the thinking of these traditional Christians on a matter that was essential for the spread of the gospel. If the Gentiles had been required to adopt the Jewish rituals and ceremonies in order to be acceptable to God, the faith would not have spread around the world as it did. And it definitely would have looked like a very different gospel. Twice repeating this story, Luke drives home the point that being one of God's people is not a matter of adopting certain rituals of other people and other faiths, but rather people of every race receiving the gospel through faith in Jesus Christ alone. This, my friends, is the story of God changing minds, God taking the initiative by giving Peter a vision of a lowered sheet with unclean animals and the command to eat, God sending his angel to Cornelius with instructions as to how to get in contact with Peter, God orchestrating the arrival of the Gentile messengers from Cornelius with Peter's vision and telling Peter to go with them without any misgivings, and God sending his Holy Spirit to them even before Peter had finished his sermon. And finally, after centuries, God's purpose is made crystal clear. And now these Jewish believers have to say, God has granted to the Gentiles also the repentance that leads to life. It did take a while to sink into their minds what God is doing, but that was the beginning of what Paul calls the mystery of Christ, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body of Christ and fellow partakers of his promises. The centuries of Israel being God's only chosen people 
had come to an end. Now all nations are on equal standing before God. And we know that this to those Jews was nothing short of revolutionary. <clears throat> well, did God's plan succeed to create a single new humanity in place of many? To create a single body of Christ undivided by racial and cultural lines? Well, the answer is uh, yes uh, and no. Yes, in terms of what God is doing and has done through people who are open to his spirit. No, in terms of what yet has to be done with many of his other people. <clears throat> you know, this is going to be very simplified, but I'm going to suggest that as Christians, we fit into two categories. One that I'd call the ethnocentric people, believing that the race and practices are the standard of the others and those who have allowed their spirit secondly to be open to all of God's diverse peoples and their practices and tradition. Now the question is which one is wrong thinking and which one is right? Well, I believe Acts 11 clearly gives us the answer. You can see it here, a house full of Gentiles believing in Christ, filled with the Holy Spirit and later Another group of Gentiles, rather than rejoicing over what God had done, grumbling about Peter's eating with them. I don't think there's any clearer uh, lesson here about valuing different traditions and God's determination to change any of our wrongheadedness that we might have. And so the question that ask, is asked us through Acts 11 is, are we truly in one accord with believers of different ethnic backgrounds and persuasions? Do we see in these people's souls our own heartbeat? Do we define each other as one? Or are we still talking about our kind of people? Do we stand equally as God's children? Are we open to it, fully open? open like Peter to be surprised by God. God wants us to go from where we are to change our minds if that's necessary. And if we're struggling with these kinds of issues, well, let's just look at how God began to change Peter's mind. Like Peter, we can start with prayer. Lord, mold me into what you want. Or like Peter, to not be afraid and be willing to enter into new environments and circumstances that are filled with different types of people, believers, and trusting God to reveal new truths, his truths. When I moved to uh, Washington, D.C., an old friend living there had just started an organization called Community of Hope, which was seeking to minister to black and Hispanics whose rent neighborhoods had been destroyed by the Martin Luther King riots. My friend Tom needed someone to guide a new board and he asked me to do it. I was happy to help, but Tom made a request, no, a demand. He insisted that I spend more time each week walking the streets, talking with the people, and as often as possible, worshiping with him in their new church storefront. Now, these were not D.C.'s middle and upper middle class blacks. They were the poor blacks of the city who were the victims of all these riots. I have to tell you that I was uncomfortable with uh, such a close connection, especially in that riot torn city. <laughs> and although in my head, uh, I had always believed I had no problem with any person who was different ethnically and especially black people, I, I was uncomfortable with that uh, level of intimacy in those streets. You know, I promised Tom I would do it and I did it for four years. And I began in those years to discover how much we had in common, how I had in common with fellow believers in that area and how much I began to love the warmth and the expression of their hearts and their worship and their love of their families. God put me in an uncomfortable position, 
to try to change me. And he did. Friends, God is most glorified when his church is made up of culturally and racially diverse people who would never share the true unity in Christ otherwise. People who are moved by the stirrings of the Holy Spirit have grown to value all of the diversity and culture that his people bring to the heavenly kingdom. So our question at the end that I ask myself and I ask all of us, do we allow God to change our minds? Let us pray. Wake us up, Lord, so that the evil of racism or prejudice finds no home within us. I pray you'll keep watch over our hearts, Lord, and remove any barriers to your grace that may oppress and offend brothers and sisters. Fill our spirits, Lord, so that we may give services of justice and peace. Clear our minds, Lord, change them and use them for your glory. We pray in your holy name. Amen.